Hello everyone, back to you in today's uh, second video. I didn't get this Sunday roundup for today's second video. So this is going to be your Sunday afternoon eclectic mix of this. We're going to be looking at things like solar activity, sea surface temperature anomalies, uh, constellation, North Atlantic oscillation, QPO, and the weather for the next uh, week to 10 days and beyond as well. So it's going to be quite an interesting uh, watch. Uh, the uh, third batch of Autumn Analogues was released earlier on today. Uh, that video is uh, here on the homepage at gazovis.com. And later on today, uh, that video will be placed on the Autumn Updates and Forecast page. And there'll be a written summary that goes with it as well. So you'll be able to have a read of that and watch the video on demand whenever you want. That'll be some time this evening. Uh, and uh, just to say that the third update, or the second update, I think it is now, uh, update number two for Glastonbury, that will be released uh, tonight around seven o'clock. Right, let's get on with it, mate. Let's start off by having a look at solar activity. So this is a solar disk on our side of this today by Sirham.net. We've got a completely spotless uh, solar disk. Again, no sunspots visible. Uh, therefore, solar activity is at very low levels, and Sirham is reporting that it's going to be staying at very low levels for the next uh, three days. This is now a month's worth, four weeks worth of spotless conditions. Haven't had any sunspots for a month. Uh, this is the Gazov is Sunny Roundup uh, solar activity tracker sent through by our good friend James Aquil, updated to yesterday, the 15th of June. And we can see the trend lines are crashing uh, now. So the three coloured lines of interest here. Uh, the orange line, which is depicting each individual day's uh, worth of sunspots, and then the thick green and thick red lines, they are our trend lines. You can see that we've basically now had a month of uh, no sunspots, so this orange line has been on the floor uh, pretty much for a month, and that is causing the green and red lines to crash. Um, the red line is now on the floor, the green line is, uh, is going to be following it very shortly if this carries on so this tells us that we are now at a very very low level of uh solar activity uh so yeah it's been a month without any sunspots and uh the trains are pretty much on the floor of the chart now it's the kind of thing you expect when you are reaching solar minimum we know we're around solar minimum we don't know when the actual solar minimum itself will occur until after it's happened but we know that certainly within the next sort of six, nine months or so, we're going to reach uh, solar minimum. And so we can expect more of this. We can expect uh, prolonged periods now where we don't get any sunspots uh, at all. And uh, be interesting to see how long this goes on for. It might go on uh, for another day or so, and then we get a sunspot. It could go on for uh, more uh, sort of more weeks or even months. You just never know. Every uh, solar minimum is different. But... Certainly, we can say that at the moment, we are at a very, very, very low level of solar activity. Now, the reason we look at this is that particularly in winter, there is an association between uh, low levels of solar activity uh, and being around or just after solar minimum and an increased risk of blocking. Uh, in the winter, blocking is the uh, route pushing cold air out of the North Pole down into mid latitude. So around or just after uh, solar minimum, you increase the chance of colder European uh, winters in particular, uh, probably due to the effects of the jet stream, causing the jet stream uh, to, uh, to go more southerly. Uh, so there we go. We're uh, at a really, really low level uh, now. We keep an eye on the Sunday Roundup Solar Activity Tracker over the uh, next few uh, weeks. Of course, big thanks to James sending that through. This is how uh, the sea surface temperature anomalies were looking in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans when we did uh, last week's uh, gas weather's um, Sunday Roundup. So our three areas of interest, we've got the Pacific Ocean, uh, just here, that's the uh, Equatorial Pacific Ocean from Peru to Indonesia. That's the Enso uh, region. We've got the Northern Pacific up there. And then we've got the North Atlantic uh, over here. So this is how the sea surface temperature anomalies were looking when we did last week's uh, sunny roundup. This is the uh, latest in terms of the sea surface temperature anomalies. So dealing with the Enso region, first of all. Again, that's how things looked last week. This is how 
things are looking now. Very little change in the Enzo uh, region. We've still got this very weak signature of El Nino clinging on by its fingertips, particularly perhaps in the more western part of the actual Pacific. Now, it is cooling a little bit over in the eastern part of the actual Pacific. This is starting to look a little bit like a weak Madokai, Madoki El Nino. That's where you uh, have, the, have it warmer in the western part, the central western part, and cooler in the eastern part of the uh, equatorial Pacific. Very weak signature, though. We are sort of like still on that borderline between being uh, in a weak El Nino or uh, at Enso neutral. Further north, very little change in the northern Pacific. So again, that situation last week, this situation now looking uh, warm in this northeastern part of the uh, of the northern Pacific Ocean or northwestern, I should say. Uh, so that uh, again, those uh, warm and average sea surface temperature anomalies have been going on for quite some time up there. Uh, really, it's typically quite a cold place, but since around sort of 2014, 2015, uh, we've had a lot of um, a lot of warmer than average sea surface temperature anomalies going on at Bali. It is looking quite warm there at the moment. In the Atlantic Ocean, let's go back to last week, see how things looking last week, and then go forwards to this week. So, um, quite uh, stable again in the Atlantic Ocean. Looks like it's still warming up around, uh, or just to the south of Greenland. Things are looking a little bit warmer there, and also looking quite warm through the tropical Pacific Ocean. Uh, and in between, it looks like things are a bit cooler, especially around Newfoundland. We still have those cold and average sea surface temperature anomalies around uh, Newfoundland. So that sort of uh, sea surface temperature anomaly profile probably favours uh, a negative NAO. Of course, we have been through uh, and are still in uh, a negative NAO and AO uh, period. More on that in a moment. This is how the Southern Oscillation Index is looking. So this is an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state in the uh, Southern Pacific Ocean. It's measuring the uh, barometric pressures between uh, Darwin in Australia and Tahiti in the Southern Ocean. This is from Queensland Government, which is part of Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. Uh, so when the SOI is in its negative phase, then the atmospheric setup is reflective of El Nino. When the SOI is in its positive phase, the atmospheric setup is reflective of La Nina, of a cold event. If we scroll down, you can see the latest numbers. These are all provisional, but they don't tend to change uh, all that much. And the um, important uh, box that we have here, the important numbers of these ones just here. So uh, going back to the start of June, you can see that the SOI was in its negative phase still got the final day of May coming out at minus 18 for example got the 3rd of June coming out at minus 16 4th of June is coming out at minus 17 these are all um, reflective of an El Nino type uh, setup but more recently the SOI has gone um, rather more positive so uh, for example we've got the 10th of June they're coming out at plus 8 we've got the 11th of June coming out at plus 19 that's very positive very reflective of a La Nina type atmospheric state. Uh, the 12th of June coming out at plus 19, uh, plus 9 I should say. 13th of June comes out at plus 5. And uh, then the very uh, latest numbers are looking like this. So we've got the 14th around neutral really at uh, minus 0 0.28. That's neither El Nino or La Nina type setup. And they've got the 15th at plus 4, sort of weak La Nina setup. 16th, of course, they're ahead of us, so 16th of uh, June has already taken place in Australia. That comes out at uh, minus 3.66. So, again, that's just very slightly into a weak El Nino type atmospheric state. Just because over the past week has seen a bit of a shift within the atmospheric setup towards something that's a little bit more reflective of either an enso neutral state or possibly even. Uh, a La Nina type state. If that was to continue, then that obviously would bring an end to this uh, ongoing sort of weak El Nino. But it's only a few days worth of data, so we'll have to wait longer over several weeks to see whether this is a fundamental pattern change or whether this is just uh, just something that's happened for a few days and then we'll go back to sort of an El Nino type atmospheric setup 
in the next week or so. So we'll keep an eye on the SOI, but there has been a shift uh, in the past few days to a more um, a landing your type uh, atmospheric setup. QBO uh, next. So this is from the uh, University of Berlin. I just wanted to show you this updated chart. They stopped updating this for several months uh, last year, but they're updating it every month now. Uh, so um, we can keep a close eye on this and we can begin to see the uh, start of the easterly phase of the QBO. So the QBO is just like an index that's uh, reflecting the strength of the zone and westerlies, if you like. When the, uh, when the QBO is in its westerly phase, um, you know, westerly QBO, then you are strengthening the zone and westerlies. When the QBO is in its easterly phase, you are weakening uh, the zone and westerlies. On this chart, uh, westerly QBO phases are these darker shaded areas just here. So that's westerly QBO. QBO. Easterly uh, QBO phases are the white shaded area. So that's an easterly QBO just there from 1967 through to 1968, just about lasting into the start of 1969. Then into westerly QBO again uh, through the bulk of 1969 into 1970. The QBO is, is uh, a very um, sort of reliable, almost pulse like alternating uh, uh, of the zone or westerlies, alternation of the zone of westerlies from uh, weakened to strengthened through the westerly and easterly QBO phases. It should be very, very regular. Uh, so coming down to the latest, and you can see we are in the westerly phase of the QBO. So it's this grey area uh, just here. Uh, that's uh, 2018 there. That's 2019 just there. Uh, port, in the important level of the atmosphere is around 30 to 50 HPA, that area just there. So that tells us that right now we are in uh, sort of a mature westerly QBO phase. We are probably seeing the beginning of the easterly QBO, though, starting to appear right at the very top of the atmosphere. So if you think that uh, this is um, depicting kind of like the levels of the atmosphere, we've got 10 HPA up here. That's right at at the very top of the stratosphere and then we've got 100 HPA which is kind of like down on the surface where we are uh, right now. So uh, this area up here is kind of like the very top of the atmosphere and where we've got these thickened sort of black lines appearing just here that's probably the end of the Westerly QBO right at the very top of the atmosphere in the stratosphere. So what's probably going to happen or what will happen is that we'll see this grey area descending uh, a little bit like that, and then a white area will start descending, and that white area will be uh, the easterly QBO. The white area will start to descend into a boundary layer of the atmosphere, something like that. So the easterly QBO uh, will be around there, and the westerly QBO, of course, that we're in right now, is uh, going to look something like that. So the very beginnings of the easterly QBO probably already starting to appear right at the very top of the stratosphere. Take several months for that to, say, to descend down into the uh, troposphere. So uh, we're probably going to see this transition from a westerly to an easterly QBO taking place over the winter. I would anticipate winter of 2019-2020 will be when this transition from westerly to easterly QBO happens. So we'll probably begin the winter of 2019-2020 in a Westy QBO and probably end the winter of 2019-2020 in an easterly QBO. Of course, it might happen a bit quicker than that. It might happen a little bit later uh, than that. So um, it'll be something that's quite important to keep an eye on as we do winter updates. They're going to start in September. And by that point, we'll be keeping a close eye on how quickly this transition from a westerly to an easterly QBO is uh, happening because the QBO is something that's more important in the winter, uh, really. So uh, a lot of our colder winters tend to coincide with easterly QBO. So if this transition to an easterly QBO was to happen quickly and the whole of the winter of 2019-2020 was an easterly QBO winter, then obviously that could have impacts for winter and it might favour getting cold winter. However, there are several examples of easy QBOs that are not cold winters. For example, we've got 2014-2015 just here. That's an easy QBO 
winter, and that's a pretty mild winter. It's close to average uh, winter, really. On the other side of the coin, though, there are Western QBO winters that are cold. So, for example, we've got 2008-2009, which is a Western QBO winter and was the first cold winter in the succession, starting with 2008-2009 and finishing with 2012-2013. Uh, so, we'll be keeping close eye on that anyway, but possibly the very first beginnings of the ECQBO side to appear right at the very top of the stratosphere on that chart. Let's progress. We're going to go on to the Arctic Oscillation. This is the AO Observed and Forecast chart. So the black line shows where we've been with the Arctic Oscillation, the uh, red line 7 where the GFS ensembles are forecasting the Arctic Oscillation to go. Uh, remember, the, as with all of the indexes, whether it's the SOI, whether it's a QBO, they're all just reflecting the atmospheric state. So it's always the weather that's driving the index. So this one is measuring the atmospheric pressures over the Arctic. And uh, when the AO is coming out negative, as it has been, a lot very recently, then you've got high pressure, you've got blocking over the Arctic around Greenland or back into the North Pole. When the Arctic Oscillation is positive, then you're going to have low pressure uh, over the pole. Now, I've been for a very prolonged period of negativity of the AO throughout the whole of May and going into the first half of June as well, about 16th of June, just there, still negative with the AO. Uh, GFS ensembles are forecasting the AO to actually go slightly positive in the next few days, so we're going to lose the northern blocking. Uh, to some degree, although by the time you get through to the end of uh, the ensembles, so that's this period just here, it's in the unreliable time frame, it's taking us almost to the start of July now, uh, by that point it looks like the um, the Arctic is beginning to go more negative uh, again, so any change towards a positive AO might be short-lived, it does happen by the look of it, it's a fairly good agreement within the uh, GFS Sobel said it's going to happen in around a week's time or f uh, a few days' time. Um, but it might be quite short-lived, and by the time it's through to the end of June and the beginning of July, we might be going back into uh, a more blocked, uh, long blocking type pattern uh, once again. This is the North Atlantic Oscillation. That's also been in very negative uh, territory. So, again, the black line shows where we've been with the NEO, the red lines at the end of GFS Ensembles, the forecasting the NEO to go. You can see that pretty much since uh, the middle of April, we've been negative with the uh, with the North Atlantic Oscillation. It did go a bit positive just there, but generally it's been trending negative for several weeks. The whole of May was a negative NEO month. That's where we are right now. The NEO is still negative. And again, this one, it's reflecting the abstract state in the North Atlantic, remember, so measuring the air pressure between Iceland and the Azores. So when the NEO is uh, negative, you're going to have high pressure around Iceland. You have low pressure around the Azores. And it's a converse when the NEO is positive. So we're negative with the NEO at the moment. We're going to stay negative for a little bit longer. Then it's going up towards neutral uh, by the look of it. But it's quite a bit of scatter within the GFS ensembles. Uh, for the NEO in this more extended range. So uh, we've got these ones just here, but are going weekly positive. These on some members just here that are remaining weekly negative. It does look as though there's a bit of a pattern change at work here for the second half of June to something slight, let's not say positive with the AO and NEO, but not as negative as it has been, possibly going towards neutral uh, type uh, conditions with the AO of uh, the NEO in the second half of June. That sh tells us that we should be seeing a relaxing of the northern blocking that we've had through May and through this first half of June. We should see a slight easing of the northern blocking, although it's not really convincing yet, but we're really strengthening the Azores high uh, at the moment. We'll know when we're doing that, when we start seeing the NEO in particular going uh, properly positive it's not doing that at the moment, but it does look as though the blocking signal that we've had through May and the first half of June is possibly easing uh, a little bit. So we keep an eye on that. Right, these are the GFS upper air temperature and precipitation ensembles. We're looking at Gray's End 
uh, today. So the red line here is a 30-year upper air temperature average for Gray's End. Temperatures are going to be on the up a little bit over the next few days. So we're starting off pretty cool still today. But by midweek, we're going fairly warm. Temperatures uh, down in the southeast, somewhere like Gray's End, could be reaching around 25 to 27 degrees, I think. Tuesday and Wednesday, that's uh, sort of going into the 80s Fahrenheit. Only very briefly, temperatures in the second half of the week are then falling away again, going below the red line, so going to be cooler than average. And then after that, it's not looking particularly exciting temperature-wise. There's perhaps a little bit of a warm-up showing up there sometime around the 24th or 25th uh, of June. But overall, it looks like bearing through towards the uh, end of month and start of July, upper air temperatures are either close to average or possibly most of those ensemble members are maybe a little bit cooler than average. A couple of drier days coming up as well after we have a few showers around today, but I think generally from today through to, uh, say, Tuesday, going to be a lot of dry weather in the southeast corner. However, Wednesday could bring some heavy showers or thunderstorms into the southeast as this temperature uh, peaks. And then after that, just looking rather showery, really, through towards the uh, final week of June. There are a fair few um, big precipitation spikes just there. Sometime around the 24th, 25th, might bring some uh, heavy and persistent rain in from off the Atlantic Ocean. Overall, there's no sign of a sustained spell of summer weather. You have to say right way through to the beginning of July now, there's no sign of sustained summer weather. But that doesn't mean there won't be a few days of uh, of nice, pleasant conditions, let's say. But there's no sign of anything, anything at all like we had last summer of uh, consistent heat and dry weather at the moment. It might come later in the summer. It's still early days for the summer of uh, 2019, but certainly at the beginning of July, no sign of anything sustained in terms of hot and dry weather. Uh, temperature anomalies from the 16th to 24th of June. Still a little bit cooler than average. I was expecting these to warm up a bit by now, but uh, they're stubbornly remaining Cooler than average, really, for the UK and for Ireland. So quite a cool week coming up. And that's even with that warmer interlude, but we're going to get one a couple of days on uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So quite cool overall. Precipitation on these are a little bit drier, though. So not uh, anywhere near as wet with these as we were seeing a few days ago. Uh, close to average with precipitation from the 16th through to the 24th of June. Over in America, it's quite a cool scene as well, interestingly. Many northern and central parts of the states coming out uh, cooler than average from the 16th to the 24th of June, looking particularly cool through the breadbasket uh, regions in the Midwest. Uh, out in the far west was the Pacific side and down towards um, states like Dallas. It looks rather, uh, states like Texas, it looks rather warm. Uh, there with uh, above average temperature anomalies. And in the far southeast, over towards Florida, it looks a little bit warmer there. So if you're planning a holiday to Florida, it should be pretty warm. Uh, Precipitation-wise in America, so in the far western states, and again, through those southern states, quite dry. Uh, but elsewhere, it looks pretty wet, especially through the central midwestern area. So where it's coolest, it looks like it's also wet uh, as well. Not much of a summer going on there for through those uh, midwestern states. Coming back uh, to home, so this is how things are looking on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we're pulling up some relatively warm air uh, from the south, but we have got this thundery low appearing across France as well. So it might go a bit warm around Tuesday or Wednesday, yes, but I think we may have to pay for that with some heavy rain or thunderstorms. Uh, that gets out of the way through, through Thursday, and then we're into a cooler, fresher, sort of showery westerly flow on Thursday. Friday, again, quite cool and unsettled. Over the weekend, though, we build up a little bit of a ridge of high pressure. So next weekend could string together a couple of dry days. I think the temperatures will probably be quite disappointing, probably quite cool, but it may turn drier there as we go through uh, next weekend. However, if the GFS is right, that's not going to last very long because look at this by Monday 24th. We've got this next low lurking just down to the southwest. We did see on the GFS ensemble chart that uh, there is a chance that it could go really quite wet sometime around the 24th, 25th of June. That is because of that area 
of low pressure just there. And so we get through to 25th of June, we're back under an area of low pressure, that ridge over the next weekend doesn't last very long at all. Low pressure is back in big time. And then we go up to day 10 and we're looking unsettled with low pressure then over just to the east of us, start to pull back those cold uh, or chilly northeasterly winds again. In the more extended range, going through the final week of June, all looking rather showery, really, low pressure, at least a trough within the 500 millibar flow is close to the country. So you'd expect showers to continue there. That's covering the Glastonbury period, of course. We will be doing a second update for the Glastonbury Festival uh, tonight around 7 o'clock. Uh, that's as far as we can get with the uh, GFS operational run today. It takes us to Tuesday, the 2nd of July. High pressure is out to the southwest. We're still pulling in relatively cool and probably quite showery north to northwest winds. GM looks like that. Again, we've got this thundery low uh, causing problems on Wednesday. That could get some really high rainfall totals as well uh, with that. So although temperatures do pick up, there is the potential for some more very wet weather around the middle part of the week unfortunately I have to firm up on where that very wet, wet weather is likely to be into the second half of the next week that fungi low gets out of the way and we start to pull in these cooler fresher sort of northwesterly winds into next weekend again there's that ridge building up so that could give us a couple of nice days next weekend Saturday and Sunday mainly dry but by the end of Sunday rain is already starting to threaten the far southwest as we go through into Monday so Monday 24th for GM is moving its low pressure in from the Atlantic so obviously it's turning much more unsettled then around the 24th, 25th of June. That's how we finish up. Still looking pretty unsettled. I have to say low pressure is uh, dominating the weather. There's a relatively big temperature contrast as well. So we've got a lot of hot air across France. We're under pretty cool air. And as we know, at this time of year, temperature contrast will tend to fuel uh, rain. So that could be quite a wet scenario, especially for more northern western areas, I would have thought, uh, around Wednesday, 26th of June. This is the ECMWF. Again, there's that thundery low that we've got on uh, Wednesday. So, again, that could bring some heavy showers, possibly thunderstorms, maybe even longer spells of thundery rain around the middle part of the week. More on that in the next day or so. Uh, then we go through to Thursday, and we're bringing in these cooler, fresher northwesterly winds, but still with sunshine and showers. Next weekend, there's that nice ridge building across the coast. Now, unlike the other two models, the ECM makes more of that ridge. So this is Monday the 24th. By this point, the GFS and the GM are breaking this ridge down, moving it away and bringing low pressure back in from the Atlantic. The ECM, though, keeps this high pressure going. So this is a more pronounced ridge of high pressure, bringing drier and warmer conditions. As we get through today, 10, just signs that the high pressure is beginning to pull out into the middle of the Atlantic, possibly threatening to pull back in cooler northwest winds. But up to day 10 anyway, the ECM this morning is by far the warmest, driest of the models. Unfortunately, it's too early to have a look at the ECM ensemble, so we don't know how that is sitting within uh, the ECM ensembles. But anyway, that particular ECM run is definitely a warmer and drier scenario up to day 10. Uh, but it's not uh, supported, we know it's not supported by the GFS or the ECM WS, so we just have to wait and see whether that turns out to be a trendsetter or whether it's just an outlier. CFS V2 looks like this. It's uh, 500 mm heights broken down into week periods. The first week period will take us from the 16th to the 22nd of June. The uh, coming week has below average heights to west southwest of us. Looks quite unsettled, quite showery. No problems with temperatures, but still looking a little bit on the unsettled side in uh, the week ahead. Week 2 is the 23rd to 29th of June with above average heights building into the east, the below average heights, the low pressure being pushed a little bit further away from us. So um, this is probably bringing up relatively warm air from a south uh, southeasterly direction. It's probably a bit drier as well. So warmer and drier in uh, week two. Week three shows that the ridge uh, slips more towards the east of Europe with below average heights coming closer to us again. So that's a cooler and more unsettled week there from the 30th of June to the 6th of July. 
And then week four, very changeable four weeks, because week four, which is the 7th to the 13th of July, brings the above average heights back again. And that will turn us warmer and drier once again. Maybe quite hot with that. Could be bringing up the winds from a southeasterly direction. So that could be uh, quite hot there from uh, the 7th to the 13th of July. Very long way out, though, four weeks away. So obviously quite unreliable. For July itself, this is a 700 mil of our height anomaly from the uh, CFS, and it's going for a bit of a blocking signal to be up to our north. But this ridge does also, to some degree anyway, extend down into central parts of Europe. So it's not a clear cut pattern. Uh, and it could bring up some warmth at times from an east or southeast direction. But as ever, with northern blocking, with high pressure up here, the risk is always, as we know from what's happened over the past few days, that we're going to run low pressure in underneath the block and uh, go into a cool and wet pattern. And it's always a danger, it's always a risk when you've got northern blocking in the summer. You've got more energy available through heat, through warmth, to uh, fuel low pressure and rain. Uh, temperature anomalies for July being forecast to be average to a little bit warmer than average from the CFS. And precipitation anomalies, as usual, uh, no particular signal for rainfall. Finally, I just want to show you the Beijing Climate Centre. So this was the 500 millibar height anomaly for the summer of 2019 from the Beijing Climate Centre last month in May. Uh, and it was going for an anticyclonic high pressure dominated summer which would send the jet stream north. So that would be basically a hot summer pattern, really. You'd have high pressure sat over the top of the UK, and you would get day after day of dry, hot, and fine weather. That's what it's showing last month. This is the latest, though, and it has done quite a flip. So you'll notice, the first thing you'll notice is that where we are, we've got this area of below average heights now appearing. Very hard to make us out on this um, map by the way but we're just there so um we've got an area of below average heights now a trough of low pressure appearing over and to the west of the country you'll also notice that we have these red colors now uh in the northern latitudes so it's massively increased the northern blocking signal for this summer uh it's massively increased that uh and as I was just explaining, at this time here, when you've got a blocking signal over the Arctic and over Greenland, you'll tend to stick up a trough of low pressure underneath it, and the Beijing Climate Center is placing that trough pretty much over the top of the country. So it has flipped. The Beijing Climate Center uh, seasonal model has flipped from what it was going for last month, which was a mainly dry, fine, high pressure dominated summer to a summer that is much more unsettled, low pressure dominated really, and therefore much cooler and much wetter summer as well with a strong northern blocking signal. So big changes from the Beijing Climate Centre for the summer of 2019 and now not looking anywhere near as, uh, as high pressure dominated as it was last month. Which, again, just goes to show you how these long-range models are prone to chopping and changing. They're very unreliable, uh, really pushing the envelope, pushing the boundaries of what is possible with forecasting. And so these flips do occur very regularly within uh, long-range output. Right, that's it for the Gals Webby Sunday Roundup today. Hope you found it interesting and informative. Don't forget to check out those autumn analogues. That video will be placed on the autumn updates page with a written summary uh, later on this evening. Before then, though, we've got the uh, second update for the Glastonbury Festival. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.